Well, God bless everybody uh, who is listening to this series of presentations on Romans chapter 9. We're now at part 8. If I've said anything that's been controversial so far, well, it may pale into insignificance with the things that I am going to go on and say in this part. Uh, and that will be concerning the identity of the Gentiles that Paul speaks about in Romans chapter 9. Now, my purpose, as I said uh, before, uh, much early on in this presentation, is not to be controversial for the sake of it, not to be argumentative or difficult or obtuse for the sake of it. But... We don't want to shy away from expounding the whole word of God just because we are afraid that some of the things that we may say will upset people who have been taught something quite different. We need to be spirit taught and we need to be taught by the spirit from the word of God, not from the traditions of men. So before me today, I'm going to speak about the identity of the Gentiles spoken about by Paul in Romans chapter 9. This to me is a very, very exciting part of the message of the book of Romans, and I hope that you will find that to be the case as well. Right now, I'd like to read this little quote from a book called The Making of a Nation, the Beginning of Israel's History. History by Charles Foster Ken and Jeremiah Whipple, and it goes back to 1912. This is something that my wife ran across a number of months ago, and I just thought I would share this with you. Just to quote, And as it is owned, the whole scheme of Scripture is not yet understood. So, if it comes to be understood, it must be in the same way as natural knowledge is come at, by the continuance and progress of learning and liberty and by particular persons attending to, comparing and pursuing intimations scattered up and down it, which are overlooked and disregarded by the generality of the world. Nor is it at all incredible that a book which has been so long in the possession of mankind should contain many truths as yet undiscovered. Now, do you believe that you have a good handle on the scriptures? Do you believe that you have a sound working knowledge of the word of God? Is it possible, if you've been in the Lord for many decades, is it possible that you know the fullness of the word of God? Do you believe that? Or is your mind open to the fact that you may not know half as much as you ought to know? Is your mind always inquiring after the things contained in the Word of God? Are you eager to continue learning? Would it offend you to discover that there are many, many things in the Bible that you may not have a proper handle on? Well, that's, that has been my experience. I have come to the conclusion that I did not know the Bible near as well as I thought I did. I thought I had a very good working knowledge of the Holy, Holy Scriptures and I had to come to a realisation that what I thought I knew in the reality was I knew very little at all. And... And as a result, I've been able to learn a great deal of things that are new to me. They're not new to God. They are new to me. There are many things that I've learned in the Bible, which, which are now I see very plainly. And I look back at the times when I didn't know them. And I wonder, how is it that I never understood these things in the past? But this is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives as, as we continue searching the Word of God, as we continue 
diligently comparing scripture with scripture and not just being satisfied with the things that are handed to us uh, sermon in, sermon out. We've got to go to the word of God ourselves and search things out. And perhaps some of the things that I'm going to outlay here to you will be wholly new. And, and it may shock you to discover that those things are in the Bible. I hope that it is a pleasant shock to you. I hope that it, is, it, is, it will delight and it will thrill you to know that there are, are vast treasures in the Word of God. Veins of gold, veins of silver that have yet been yet to be uncovered. And when you run across them, you jump for joy because you find great joy. And this has been my experience. And, and I hope that as you go on and you hear new things from the Word of God, that you don't close your mind to them because they're new. You don't get offended at them because uh, that's not what they preach at the local church that you go to. We've got to go between ourselves and God alone and let the word of God speak to us. Let, let us be Holy Spirit taught and Holy Spirit led people of God. Amen. I'm picking the message up now in Romans chapter 9, partway through verse 23 the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory. Verse 24, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. And so, for many people, this is where they believe that although Paul spoke about the birthright blessings and promises all being given to Israel according to the flesh, this is where they believe Paul goes on and clarifies what he has said by saying that those promises also belong with the Gentiles. Now here is a very, very important question which we need to ask. Who are the Gentiles to whom Paul is referring to in his message? For most Christians, for most people that read the Bible, they believe that the Gentiles are non-Jews or non-Israelites, end of story. It is deeply entrenched in our thinking, in the way that we are taught in the church world, that when the scripture talks about Gentiles, it is an exclusive reference to people other than Jews or other than Israelites. But even, even before we go into this and look at it in further detail, even now we have to challenge part of that thinking because right here in verse 24, Paul is simply drawing a distinction and a delineation in relation to the Jewish portion of Israel. He says, whom he hath called not of the Jews only, but also of the, of the Gentiles. He does not say not of the Israelites only, but also of the Gentiles. Paul is very specific and he knows what words he is using. They are not being, the, his words are not employed randomly or accidentally. When he's drawing the delineation between these two parties, he speaks of the Jewish portion of Israel only. He is not drawing a comparison between Israel and the Gentiles. So immediately we've got to start thinking a little more deeply than we ordinarily think about this passage. Because a lot of us read that verse and run off and say, oh well, uh, Paul is talking about the Israelites and the Gentiles, but that's not the case at all. He's talking about the Jews and also the Gentiles. Now, we need to ask and discover 
who are these Gentiles? The word the word Gentile appears in the King James Version of the Bible very extensively. In the Old Testament, it is derived from the Hebrew word goy, singular, and goyim, plural. In the KJV Version of the Bible, it appears, is translated as nation 374 times, heathen 143. It comes as Gentiles only 30 times and people 11 times in the new testament there's actually two greek words for the word gentile and one of the greek words there is ethnos singular and ethne plural and that is translated in the kjv as gentiles 93 times nation 64 times heathen five times and people twice and then there is a second Greek word, Helen, or Ellen, meaning Greeks, but sometimes translated as Gentiles in our KJV. So it, this word, Helen, appears as the word Greek 20 times in the KJV and Gentile 7 times. Now, I think that in all the modern translations, the Greek word, Helen, always is translated as Greek. So this will just give you some basic understanding of how the word Gentile is employed in the Bible when we go back and look at the Hebrew and Greek words from which it is derived. So right now I just want to read two passages from the Old Testament just to show you how this Hebrew word goyim is employed not ex how that it is employed not as an exclusive reference to non-Israelites in Genesis 25 verse 23 it says, two nations are in thy womb. Now this was the word of the Lord spoken unto Rebekah concerning uh, Esau and Jacob who were in her womb. Now when the Lord said, two nations are in thy womb, that word, their nations, is the Hebrew word goyim. The Lord was obviously not saying two Gentiles are in thy womb because... Rebecca was was an Hebrew. Isaac and Rebecca were Hebrews. He wasn't saying to non-Israelite people are in thy womb, to quote Gentiles are in thy womb. No, it was to nations are in thy womb. This demonstrates that when we are talking about the Old Testament word goyim, which is translated sometimes as Gentiles, it's not always an exclusive reference to non-Israelites. In Genesis 35 verse 11, And God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. And here again we have this word nation and nations from the Hebrew word goy or goyim, which is also translated as Gentiles in the Old Testament. Clearly, when the Lord said to Abraham that he was to be fruitful and multiply, he wasn't suggesting that gen a Gentile and a company of Gentiles should be of him. No, it was a nation and a company of nations. It was referring to the offspring of, that would come through Jacob, Israel, and his descendants. They'd all be Israelite nations. So again, I'm just pointing out that the use of the Old Testament word goy or goyim is not an exclusive reference to non-Israelitish people. Here, the reference is very much to Hebrews and Israelites. Let's go on. If we swing across now into the New Testament to look at the Greek word 
ethnos, which is most commonly translated as Gentiles. Here we read in John 18, verse 35, Pilate answered and said, Am I a Jew, thine own nation? This word nation is the same Greek word ethnos, which is most commonly translated as Gentiles. But clearly, when Paul was speaking, saying, Am I a Jew, thy own nation? He wasn't suggesting at all that he was non-Jewish or, or non-Israelitish in that sense when he used the word nation or the Greek word ethnos. In Acts 10 verse 22, it refers to the nation of the Jews, the ethnos of the Jews. It is simply not a reference to non-Jewish people in this case. It's not a reference to non-Israelitish people. It is a reference to the Jewish people, the word, Greek word ethnos. In Acts 7 verse 45, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles whom God drove out before the face of our fathers. Here the word Gentiles is the same Greek word ethnos, translated as nation in John 18 in Acts 22. Here in Acts 7 verse 45, the Greek word ethnos translated as Gentiles is clearly a reference to non-Israelites because it's referring to the Canaanites. So it is very much the context of the passage that determines the correct meaning of the word ethnos. I'll say that again. The context of the passage gives to us the correct understanding of this Greek word ethnos. Whether it be a nation, Israelitish, or a nation, non-Israelitish, being in this, say here in Acts chapter 7 verse 45, Canaanites. We must let the Bible interpret itself. We must not come to the Bible and say, well, in this case, we're talking about the word Gentiles, we must not come to the Bible and say, because we already know that Gentiles are non-Israelites, then that's what the word Gentiles always mean. Because if we come to the Bible with that mindset, we're not going to learn anything new. That is thinking derived from the tradition of our fathers, and our thinking is meant to be derived from, by the Holy Spirit as we inquire into the Word of God. Let's go on. Let's go on. So if we get out our strong concordance and look at the word Gentiles, it gives us something quite interesting. So I just want to point this out that when we are going to our concordances, we must remember that this is extra biblical evidence. Some people regard Strong's Concordance as on par with the sacred and inspired Word of God. But it's not. Strong's was fallible. Strong's didn't get everything right. Uh, I think Strong's views on the Word of God and on Christianity were somewhat on the liberal side of things. So even when we come to our concordances, we must come to it with some degree of caution and scepticism, recognising that we are dealing with men, and men make mistakes. That being said, however, Strong's Concordance does give us some interesting insight into the word, uh, the Greek word ethnos, translated mostly as Gentiles in the New Testament. Here it is the Greek, uh, it is the Strong's number in the New Testament, 1484, and it says of this word, it is a multitude, whether of men or beasts, associated or living together, a troop, a company, swarm, a multitude of individuals of the same nature or genus, the human family, a tribe, nation, people, group, in the Old Testament, foreign nations not worshipping the true God, 
pagans, Gentiles, Paul uses the term for Gentile Christians. Now, I find this very interesting as I read this definition from the concordance that nowhere in there do we find that the Greek word ethnos is an exclusive reference to non-Israelites. The fact of the matter is, by virtue of this definition, the Greek word ethnos could refer to Israelites themselves because it does talk about the word meaning a multitude associated living together, a company, a tribe, nation, people, group. So what I want us to question in our minds, does this word Gentile refer exclusively to non-Jewish or in particular, does it refer exclusively to non-Israelites or is there more to the word Gentiles than we generally believe is the case? Let's continue reading. In the very last slide, we looked at the Strong's definition of the word Gentiles use in the New Testament. And I did point out that Strong's concordance is extra biblical evidence and we do need to approach anything that is extra biblical with some degree of scepticism and caution. Now, wouldn't it be great, wouldn't it be helpful if the Bible itself defined who these Gentiles are to whom Paul is referring. If the Bible itself was to give us the definition, then we would surely have something that was unassailable, unquestionable. Well, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, the Bible does define for us who these Gentiles are that Paul is referring to. For as we read in Romans chapter 9, picking it up again in verse 24, even us who he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, verse 25 and verse 26 contain the definition. As he saith also in Hosea, or Hosea here, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there they shall be called the children of the living God. The Gentiles that Paul was referring to in verse 24 are, are explained in verses 25 and verse 26. And if we can understand what's in verse 25 and verse 26, we, have, we will have a key that unlocks the understanding of, of the message that Paul is speaking to the Romans. Let's keep reading. Now, who are these people called not a people that Paul has just spoken about? Who is this called not beloved? Who was once a people, then became called not a people? Who was once beloved, then became not beloved. Would it matter to us if there was a people in our Bibles who were specifically called not a people and not a beloved? Would it matter to us? Would that affect our thinking on who these people are to whom Paul was referring to in verses uh, 25 and verse 26? Or would we just brush it aside and say, no, look, we already know who these Gentiles are. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. We already know. It must matter to us as people of the Word of God. It must matter to us as Christians who love the Word of God. It must matter to us who these people are because if we can find them in our Bible, then we, we will understand precisely the people that Paul was referring to. And this is what we're going to go on and look at right now. Now, Paul quoted from 
the prophet Hosea in Romans chapter 9, verse 25. But let me ask you this question, dear friends. When was the last time you ever heard anybody preaching on Romans chapter 9, verse 25 and other parts besides? When was the last time you ever heard anybody go back to the book of Hosea to see what Paul was saying? When did you ever hear anybody go back to the book of Hosea to demonstrate the people to who Paul was referring to. In my own personal experience, I never ran across it once. When I read Romans chapter 9, verse 25, I thought I already knew who the Gentiles were in my own mind, so I didn't bother with the instruction manual. I didn't bother going back and digging into the Word of God because I thought I already knew what Paul was referring to. But this is the problem that we run across when we handle the words of life. We put tradition above the Word of God. We put our own personal views above the Word of God. We come to the New Testament. We decide what it means in our own minds and we ignore the foundation. I heard a preacher say this recently, a text without its context is only a pretext. Well, I'll say to you right now, if we have in our minds that the Gentiles are a reference to non-Israelites, well, that's a text out of its context, and that's a pretext, as we're going to go on and demonstrate. The fact of the matter is we should not base our interpretation of the New Testament on our own understanding or tradition. We should not do away with the Old Testament, which is our schoolmaster. The fact of the matter is a good lot of Christian people are economical with their Bible reading. They speed read. They just pick out a verse here and there for the day, and that's about the extent of their Bible study. Most of us do not go back to the Old Testament because we believe what we know we believe we know what the New Testament means anyway. So why bother wasting our time and go back to the foundation? And this is why there is considerable misunderstanding of the message in the New Testament. We can't properly understand God's unfolding plan and purpose unless we know the foundation, unless we are familiar with our Old Testament because the New Testament is built upon it. And we're going to go on now and get our foundation correct and thus our understanding of what Paul is saying in the New Testament. So, if we go back and dig into Hosea chapter 1, it's picking up in verse 4, it says, I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and I will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Verse 6, And she conceived again and bare a daughter, and God said unto him, Call her name Lo Ruhama, for I will have sorry, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but will utterly take them away. Then said God, Call his name Loami, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. The message of the book of Hosea is clearly and unambiguously a message delivered by the prophet Hosea to the house of Israel. I'll say that again. It is a message delivered by the prophet Hosea to the house of Israel, not to any other people, but to the house of Israel. 
And as you go on and read Hosea, there are references to the house of Judah as well. But these are Israelites to who to whom Hosea is referring to. Now Hosea uh, led an extraordinary life under the guidance of the Lord, and he took to himself a wife, a wife of whoredoms, and uh, there were. A daughter. There was a daughter born and two sons. The daughter's name was Loruhama, which signified no mercy upon the house of Israel. And one of the sons was called Loami, which signified not a people. That is what Loami means, not a people, and I will not be your God. It is a message delivered to the house of Israel concerning the, the casting away of the house of Israel, concerning the divorce of the house of Israel, concerning the fact that they were to be carried away into captivity far, far away. When Paul is referring to the people that would be shown no mercy, the people that would be, that were no people, who was he referring to? It's here in front of our eyes in Hosea chapter 1. Hosea 1 verse 10, yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered, and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people. They they are the very words that Paul uses in Romans chapter 9. Ye are not my people. There it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. I strongly urge you and encourage you to read the book of Hosea and it will open up your understanding concerning the word of God. When you read Hosea, ask yourself the question, to whom was the prophet speaking? The prophet was speaking to the house of Israel primarily, and there are some references to the house of Judah, to the children of Judah. But he was not speaking to non-Israelitish people. He wasn't speaking to the Canaanites. He wasn't speaking to the Africans. He was speaking to the children of Israel. And they were the people cast off. They were the people shown no mercy they were the people that were to be deemed low ami, not my people. And then afterwards it would be said of the very same people, ye are the sons of the living God, which is talking about New Testament spirit-filled Christians. So, who are the Gentiles of Romans chapter 9? The definition is given to us in our Bibles. Romans 9 verse 25, As he saith also in Hosea, I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved, and it shall come to pass in the place where it said unto them, Ye are not my people, there they shall be called the sons, the children of the living God. This is a quotation from Hosea. As Paul has said, all we need do now is go back to Hosea and we read in, in Hosea 1 verse 9, Then said God, Call his name Loemi, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. In verse 10, And it shall come to pass that in the place where it said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, that is, the same people who are called not a people, that is, the house of Israel, it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Then the children of Judah and the children of Israel uh, be gathered 
together. The Bible tells us that the Gentiles to whom Paul is referring to is the cast off of the house of Israel. It can be no other. That is, unless we, unless we do away with the Old Testament, unless we don't accept that the New Testament is built upon the foundation of the Old Testament. That is, unless we are so entrenched with our tradition and the things that have been passed down to us, then if that is the case, uh, then we might as well toss our Old Testaments into the bin for all the good that they will do us. Christian people have to be people of the book, and that book is the Bible, and that's all 66 books. The Gentiles of Romans chapter 9 are the cast off house of Israel referred to by the prophet Hosea. As this is pro proving to be a very lengthy part of the presentation, I'm going to end it here at part 8 in this series on Romans chapter 9, and I'm going to go on in part 9 and pick straight back up on this thought of identifying who the Gentiles are that Paul is referring to because there is more evidence in Romans chapter 9 as to the people that Paul is referring to. So I hope that you will continue on and hear me out. I look forward to joining with you in the next presentation. God bless.